Welcome back, Ocean students who are taking World Literature, ENGL 256. Today we are going to discuss briefly module, three and module, module 3 and Module 4. Again, to refer to course material, you have the textbook, the Norton Anthology of World Literature, Volumes D, E, and F. Module 3 and 4 that we are discussing today are found in Volume D. Until you have a hard copy of the book, scanned copies of the designated pages that you need to work on will be sent to you by the ocean unit at the faculty. As usual, this presentation is only a guide as a substitute for our face-to-face -face classes as well as the follow-up meetings that we have on Thursdays and Sundays for further questions. This is not a substitute for campus material or for the work that you need to do with your online tutors. I kept the assessments as a reminder for you and it is going to be there in all the videos just that you can remember all the assessments that you are required to do and their allocated percentage. There will be a separate video for critical response essays and research paper. These are going to be compiled in one video so that you will have a clear idea about what to do regarding this 40% and you can start working on them very soon. First, module 3. The due date is April 6th and module 3 is speaking about two main texts written by two women writers. The first is Mary Wollstonecraft. She is an English writer who lived in the 18th century and she wrote a very important book, which is considered to be a polemical feminist text. يعني أول نص نسوي يدافع عن حقوق المرأة إبراشر وبقى مشهور ومعروف. The other woman writer is Sir Juana Anes del Cross, and she is a Mexican nun and poet who lived in the 17th century and she wrote again another important letter. This letter is considered also a feminist text. You have extracts from both Wollstone's craft book and Guana's letter in your reading material. The main points that you want to focus on in module 3 and that are going to help you with the discussion are as follows. Both Wollstonecraft and Guana believe that women have the same intellectual abilities as men. They are as clever as men. And so they, will be, uh, they should be allowed the right to get educated in all fields of knowledge. This means that knowledge should not be restricted to a specific kind. All types of disciplines should be open for them. especially. Bio biology, physics, theology, okay? There shouldn't be any assumption that women should learn subjects that are less difficult than men. So both of them are calling for the same thing. Guana's letter is an answer back to an accusation towards her by a bishop and this is the Bishop of Puebla. His name was Manuel Fernand de la Croix. This bishop wrote a letter in which he attacked Guana, but instead of attacking her directly, he fashioned or created a conversation between two nuns. One of them is the imagined created nun, Cleota de la Croix, and the other one is Guana herself. In this document, the nun, Floetta, was actually accusing Guana that she is wasting her life and she is wasting her time by reading books and by learning about worldly matters. Worldly matters, yani kul al-ulum al insan Her advice to Guana was that she should focus only on theological and religious matters or spiritual matters and she should not waste her time by 
learning about any subject other than religion. Guana wrote her letter, the one that you have in your textbook and the one that you are supposed to be focusing on in the discussion, in order to answer back this accusation. She defended herself and in this defense she tried to show that learning about worldly subject is as important as learning about religion and that women are capable of learning about all types of fields of knowledge just like men so she was calling for the fact that women are rational and intelligent the same as men this is the same argument that mary wollstonecraft in her book the vindication of the rights of women originally published in 1792 was saying so both of them are saying the same thing your discussion which is entitled education and equal rights the topic is about what role does education play in equal rights for both genders both of our authors this session argue that women should be offered the same educational opportunities as men do you think that access to education for women or anyone is still an issue in american society what would mary wollstonecraft or guana anis have to say about American education in the early 21st century. So, the discussion here asks you to extend the basic ideas that each of these women, and you can you choose one of them, on the 21st century educational context. You may use the American society or Egyptian society or both. I prepare these tips to help you answer the discussion. So again, the very first thing that we have to agree on is that both of them, whether you decide to use Guana or Mary Wollstonecraft or both, both of them argue that women have the same intellectual abilities as men and should be given the same opportunities as men to study all fields of knowledge. Both of them had a passion for knowledge, they were self-educated, and they believed that if women get good education, they are going to have a good influence on the whole world. So, how far is this applicable to, our, to the American society or to the Egyptian society in the 21st century? Of course, it is still applicable. Equal education is not yet available for all girls in the 21st century. Even though governments try to make compulsory education accessible, to all human beings, whether in America or in Egypt, we still have other variables or other reasons why it is not accessible and why not all girls are really getting equal education as boys. First of all, we have the influence of the dominance of patriarchal ideology, which means the influence of patriarchal thinking, which believes that girls are well suited and better suited to stay at home and to get married. The second reason is living in rural areas. Living in villages, people there don't have the culture to make their girls educated or well educated. The third reason is economic reasons. Poor families still have a problem with sending the girls to school and maintaining them in school for a while until they get a university degree. So yes, the ideas of the two writers is still applicable. And another proof for this is that we have still feminists. Feminists are men and women who fight for women's rights. Feminists all over the world, not only in America or in Egypt, are still fighting for equal opportunities in education and in other aspects for women. So this is further proof that the two writers' ideas are still relevant to our 21st century context. Now we will move to Module 4. Module 4 introduces a novel called Garibald's Travels by an English writer, Jonathan Swift. And in your anthology, in your textbook, you will have only part 4 of Gulliver's Travels, although Gulliver's Travels, the novel, is divided into four parts. 
and you have two pages that speak about Jonathan Swift himself. These are the main points in the module that will help you with the discussion and will help you with understanding the module and being able to answer the quiz as well. First of all, Gulliver's Travel was written in 1726 by Jonathan Swift, the English novelist. It's an adventure story divided into four parts. Each part shows us Lemuel Gulliver, that he's the protagonist, in a new imaginary place. So he goes to four imaginary places. Part four, the one that you have in your textbook, deals with the Yahoos and the honeymoons. And these are two creatures, and they are used in order to criticize human beings and the human condition. So both the Yahoos and the honeymoons are the two extremes of human beings. The two extremes is either you have one human being who is extremely rational okay, and another one who is inst extremely instinctive. And both of them are ridiculed. Of course, the whole novel is based on satire and irony. Satire, yani sukhreya, and satire means that you are using exaggeration, you are using comic situation, role reversal, in order to criticize human beings. Swift criticizes human weakness and human evil by using, as we said, exa exaggeration, role reversal, and ridiculous comic scenes. The discussion focuses on satire. The due date is April 6, so we have module 3 and module 4 having the same due date. The topic of the discussion is, and I'm going to read it, Gulliver's travel is a satire Swift is using ridiculous situations to communicate to his readers the absurdity he sees in the real world. Absurdity, yani hamaqa. So, can you give an example of one moment in the plot يعني مطلوب منكو example واحد بس على حدث واحد بس بيحصل في الرواية that Swift creates to comment on the absurdity of the world as he sees بيستخدم في الستائر وإيه معنى الستائر المستخدم if you need a starting place ask yourself what does size have to do with it why is Gulliver both huge and small in different countries This is a summary of the four journeys that are presented in the novel. Your focus is on part four or the final journey, but you can still use any example from the whole novel for this discussion. The first journey that Gulliver takes takes him to the land of the Lilliput. The Lilliput are very small people, they are six inch tall, and of course, Gulliver is a giant. Still, in this particular country, he is the prisoner of the Lilliputs. Okay? And they, they are able to walk all over him. Of course, this is a ridiculous or a comic scene. But the satire here is that he is satirizing the strength and the big sides of Gulliver, saying that even though he is big and large, yet he was imprisoned by the small tiny Lilliputs. The second journey takes him to Rodengan, and this is a reversal of the situation. Now, Gulliver, in this second journey, is the dwarf, he is the little man, and he is surrounded by giants. And of course, they treat him as if he is a courtesy in a circus, giving them shows that are going to make them entertained. The third journey takes him to Aliputa, and Liputa is a floating island which have people who are only interested in mathematics and music. And these people cannot deal with everyday life, so they lack the ability to understand any other subject other than music and mathematics. And of course here he is satirizing the Enlightenment with its focus on reason. The final journey 
is in the land of the honeymoons, a society of intelligent reasoning horses. So we have the intelligent creatures are horses and the unintelligent savage creatures are humans, which is again another role reversal in order to show that human beings are wicked, fools, and filthy. I've included here a number of examples of satire and irony that are used in the novel in all the four adventures. You can choose any of these, but be careful not to copy them word for word, or you can come up with others from reading the novel. The first example, as we said, is about Gulliver being a giant prisoner in the land of the Lilliput, and this is as a criticism or a satire on his large body that does not protect him from the little Lilliputs. Another satire is that the Lilliputs are fighting with their neighbors, the Prefesco, over which end of the egg to break. This is a satire on the war between England and France that have no valid reason. These are wars that have been continuing for a very long time. And of course, this is a ridiculous fight. A third example is Lilliput's method of selecting people for public office. So anyone who wants to become an officer in the government will have to be able to rope dance, dance on ropes. In order to be chosen, the man who has best rope dancing abilities gets the higher office. And this is of course satire on the conditions of Europe and of the conditions of the officials who work in the governments in Europe. Another example has to do with Gulliver's size, because in the discussion you had a reference to Gulliver's size. Gulliver when he was a giant in, in the Lilliput's land, he was treated with respect, although he was a prisoner. When he goes to the lands of giants, he is treated as if he is a playmate or a, a toy. Okay. He is for, forced to perform shows of public amusement to all the people who are living in Broadwick. He is a source of entertaining. He is like the clown. On Leputa, he sees the people who are highly skilled in mathematics, but have no knowledge of anything else. And as we said, this is a satire on the belief in reason presented by the Enlightenment. The last part, part four, has the satire on the Honeymans and the Yahoos, because the Honeymans are reasonable horses, and the Yahoos are filthy, ugly, wicked human beings. And the satire here achieves its extreme, or its peak. Because he says that human beings have flaws, flaws and weaknesses, and that these flaws are making human beings degenerate. It's leading to the total degradation of the human. Yani humans lack ethics and morals. So, the purpose of this presentation was to give you a guide about how to go about doing the discussions. For further questions, we will meet online as usual during the assigned hours. Thank you very much and stay safe.